Morning. Oh, come on. What is that? I know it's early, but you can do better. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's much better. That's much better. Okay, my name is Mr. Hendry, Jim Hendry. And my family, we have what we call history come to life. And we bring people from history that lived a long time ago, we bring them to the present. So you can see them and you can hear them and you can talk to them, you can touch them. And so you you know, there are going to be several people later on during the How many are going to be here for all three days? Okay. How many don't know? Okay. Well, good. Okay, if you're here for the whole time, you're going to meet several different people from history. And they're going to be here. And they're going to talk to you. For example, later on today, okay, we're going to have John Harper from the Titanic. How many have ever heard of John Harper? You must be homeschoolers. All right. That's good. <laughs> So he's going to be here later on the next session. So that'll be exciting. All right, we have some other folks come through the next couple of days. So it'll be, I'll we'll make sure you're here every, every time. So what, what we're going to do this time is we're not going to talk about one person. We're going to talk about a bunch of people from history. Okay, and this, by the way, this is my son, Nathaniel. Okay, he's, he draws with chalk. All right, so... And by the way, just another thing for you to stick in your mind. How old are you? Fourteen. Fourteen. All right. I have another son that's twelve. Okay. When did you start talking? When he was twelve. All right. So he started doing this when he was twelve years old. All right. How many, anybody twelve years old in here? Almost. Okay. How many are almost twelve? <laughs> Good. All right. So you know, because sometimes people think. You know, well, I'll, I'll serve God when, I'm, when I get old. You're like 20. But it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to wait until you're 20, okay? You can be doing great things at 12 or 14 or 10 or 8. Okay, we, our family's been doing this for a lot of years, and we, I have four children who are older than them, and ever since they were little, they were helping. Okay, they're right a part of it. Okay, and that's a good thing about homeschooling, right? So you can have a lot of freedom to work with your family, doing a lot of different things. Okay, so you can do things together. You can serve God as a family. You don't have to wait till you get old and go to college and go to seminary and go wait till you're 35 years old before you start serving God. You can do it now. All right, in fact, some of the people I'm going to be talking about shortly, okay, we're thinking about what they're going to do to serve God when they were young. So we'll talk about that. Let me start talking about a little girl. She lived in Great Britain, and she had brown eyes. How many people have brown eyes in here? OK. All right, but you know this little girl? She thought it'd be so, she'd be so much prettier if she had blue eyes. Aren't blue eyes better? I got blue eyes. Don't, don't you think blue eyes are better? Yeah, yeah, blue eyes are better. All right, that's what she thought, too. All right, but, and so she prayed. Say, God, I know you can, you can do all kinds of miracles. You can change my brown eyes to blue eyes. And so she prayed right before she went to bed. She said, Lord, I'm expecting you to do this. I'm trusting you to do this. And she woke up in the morning, and she went to the mirror, and she looked in the mirror, and her eyes were brown. And she was so disappointed. You have a question, buddy? I remember the story I've heard before. You heard it before? Well, it's a good story. So I want you to remember it. So sometime later on, someone talks about, well, God didn't answer your prayer. Or when you're thinking, you know, would you pray something and God didn't answer your prayer the way you thought he should? You can remember this story. Oh, there's several stories kind of like this. All right, so God didn't answer our prayer. So does that mean God's a big meanie? That he doesn't answer our prayers? Maybe he was too busy. Was he too busy that day? No. Why do you think he didn't answer her prayer the way she thought he should? Anybody have an idea? Hmm? Right. Okay, who made you? God. All right. Does God make mistakes? No. So if you have brown eyes, as 
Do you think there might be a reason God wants you to have brown eyes? If you have blue eyes, do you think there might be a reason God wants you to have blue eyes? Because he wants you to be better looking than everybody else, right? Yeah. No, no. All right. So some people are made, you know, God, the Bible even says that God made some people blind. He created them that way. He created some people blind. Remember, there's a story in the Bible. I'll get back to the little girl in just a minute. There's a story in the Bible about a man who was born blind. Do you remember that story? All right, who can tell me that story? Anybody want to volunteer for that story? Maybe not. All right, so there's a man who was born blind, and he was sitting there begging. Okay, and Jesus came by. And what did Jesus do? He healed, he healed him so he could see, right? Okay, and the disciples were all upset. So before Jesus healed him, said, well, why is he blind? Did he sin? Or did his parents sin, and that's why he was punished for being blind? No. Jesus said that he was made that way for the glory of God. Okay? And when Jesus healed him, that showed God's glory. Now, some people are born blind, and they don't get healed, but they can still glorify God even when they're blind. So, in fact, we'll talk about somebody like that a little later. All right, so getting back to this little girl. Okay? She still had her brown eyes, and she was very upset, but she trusted God, that God knew what he was doing, that God had a plan that she didn't understand at that point. Okay, and when she grew up, Okay, her name is Amy Carmichael. When she grew up, she went to be a missionary in India. Okay, people in India have brown eyes. And there were some bad things going on with the, their religion in India that they would take little girls and make them do bad things. And she thought, well, that was wrong. So she wanted to help those little girls so they wouldn't be made to do bad things. And so she would dress up as an Indian woman and go to the place where they had these girls and she would take the girls away and give them their freedom. She would train them up to serve God, to tell them about God. And she rescued hundreds of girls like that. But one reason she could do it, you know, because she would dress up as an Indian, she'd put some things, some, something on her face to make it look a little darker because they have dark skin there. But one thing that she couldn't have changed about her was her eyes. Okay, so if she had blue eyes, if someone had seen her, she, they would say, hey, you're not an Indian. What are you doing? And you're not one of us. Okay, and she wouldn't have been able to help those girls. But because God didn't answer the prayer the way she wanted it, he was able to do a greater plan. So it wasn't just so she could look pretty. There's nothing wrong with looking pretty. But... God had a greater plan, a bigger plan, for her to save hundreds of girls out of a very bad situation. And many of them came to know Christ. So God had a bigger plan. So we have to remember that. You know, the, the name of this talk, I guess I should tell you since we're halfway into it, okay, is His Eyes on the Sparrow. Okay, remember the scripture says that even a sparrow falls, that God doesn't see it? Okay? So God cares about little things, Right? It's not just big. Sometimes we don't pray about things because we think that God only cares about big things. What am I going to do with my life? Who do you want me to marry? Those are good things to pray about. Okay, but do we pray about who do you want to talk? Who do you want me to talk to today at church after church is over? Who can I encourage? Yeah, you know, some someday we'll say, well, that's a little thing. Well, God cares about the little things, and so we have to be thinking about that. Okay, so even a little thing. A little girl's prayer about what color her eyes are. God cared about that. And he was able to use that in a mighty way. So let's talk about another girl. that something bad happened to. Okay, the way we think of things is bad. Okay, there's a little girl. And when she was a little baby, she was sick. There was something wrong with her eyes. Okay, some of you know the story, don't you? Right. And so... This person who was supposed to be a doctor came and put some things, put some ointment on her eyes, hoping to make it better, but it really made her blind when she was just a little baby. That's a bad thing, isn't it? Don't we think that's a bad thing? Well, but God also in her life put a very loving, caring grandmother who taught her the Bible, who taught her to be content. 
even in her situation, even what some people would consider bad, she had to be content, even in that situation. So God has a purpose for that. And so, who knows the name of this girl that I'm talking about? Okay, what is it? Uh, well, actually, that's, she's a good one, but that's not the one I'm thinking about at this point. Okay, this girl grew up and wrote a lot of poems and a lot of hymns. Fanny Crosby. Right. And so she was able, because she accepted her situation, she was able to go on to a school for the blind. Then she was able to teach at the school for the blind. Okay? And she wrote poems. You know, and her grandmother was a wonderful person, okay? which should be an encouragement to us that we can encourage other folks to do things that maybe they didn't think they could do. Her, mother would, her grandmother would describe the sunset. She described trees and flowers. And so even though Fanny couldn't actually see them with her eyes, she could see them in her mind as well as she could imagine them. And the most important thing was her grandmother read the scriptures to her over and over and over and over. And God gave Fanny a great mind so she could remember things. Yet by the time she was grown up, she knew the entire New Testament. She knew the entire book of Psalms. And she knew several other books of the Old Testament. She knew huge portions of Scripture. And God was able to use that in her life to, to later on to write these hymns. Okay, how many know the song, To God Be the Glory? To God Be the Glory. Okay, she wrote that song. Okay, how many know the song, Rescue the Perishing? Rescue the Perishing, care. Okay, she wrote that song. She wrote 6,000 hymns. 6,000. Now, we don't sing a lot of them now anymore, but... There are whole, if you look in your hymnal, when you go to church, if you have a hymnal, okay, look up Fanny Crosby, and there'll be a whole bunch of, pretty much guaranteed, there'll be a whole bunch of hymns in your hymn book by Fanny Crosby. Okay, and God used that little blind girl. And some people, sometimes people would ask her, say, well, aren't you upset about being blind? And she would say, no. In fact, when she was eight, she wrote a little poem. She said, oh, what a happy girl am I, although I cannot see. And then it concluded with, to weep and cry because I'm blind, I cannot, and I won't. I won't. She just chose not to gripe about her bad situation, or what should be, most people would say about this bad situation. And, you know, one thing, she, she had a, an eternal perspective. Because sometimes we, get, we start thinking about what's here and now. But what's here and now is just for a little while. Okay, what's most important is learning about God and learning the scriptures because those last forever. Okay, and people last forever. So we need to focus on helping people. But one time when someone asked her about being upset about being blind, she said, no, because when I get to heaven, because I won't be able to see until I get to heaven, but the first face that I see will be the Lord Jesus. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? What a great perspective that God put that in her mind. God worked in her heart. People say, most people say this is a bad situation, but God knows my situation, and he's going to use it for his glory. All right, so how about, uh, let's talk about, we'll just kind of jump around a little bit. Okay, there's another woman. We'll talk about several women. Her name is Darlene Dibler Rose, and she was a missionary out in the Pacific area. And so she was serving the Lord and doing great. No, so if you're serving the Lord, everything should go great, right? I mean, that's what we think, right? I mean, I think that a lot of times. Okay, I'm serving God, so God should make all my paths straight. Okay, my road should be level. Everything should be wonderful, right? Because I deserve that because I'm serving him. It doesn't always happen that way, does it? You have I think that would be all right. You know where it is? It's right next door. All right, so this woman, she was serving God. And this was about the time of, the, of World War II. And so the area where she was was taken over by the Japanese. And the Japanese didn't like Americans. And so even though she wasn't doing anything wrong, they accused her of being a spy, even though she wasn't really. And so they threw her in a prison. <laughs> Is that fair? 
to be falsely accused. You're trying to serve God and you get thrown in prison? You know, and they were mean to her. They would beat her and all, do all kinds of things to her. And it was, it was a very bad situation. And they gave her this terrible food. Yeah, one time she was eating something and she saw some little white specks in there and she thought it was little coconut flakes. But then she realized that they were moving. There were worms in her food. But she was so hungry, she just ate it anyway. That's protein, right? The worms are protein. That's good for you. So, and one time she was looking out the window. She had a little window in her cell. And she was looking outside and she could see a banana tree just drove it right outside the fence of the prison. She said, Lord, I would so much like to have a banana. Can you, can you, can you give me a banana? I mean, this is a little thing, right? We're talking about God, you know, he cares about little things. Well, the next day, she went down and she was being questioned by the, the warden of the prison. And he was being mean to her and you know, she was sent back to her cell. And then later on that afternoon, she heard footsteps coming down the hall. And she said, oh no, I forgot to salute the warden when I, when I got finished, because he had to salute the warden when you came in and then when you left. She said, I forgot to salute the warden. They're going to come, they're going to beat me up, because I forgot to do that. And so the footsteps came down the hall. And the door opened to her cell. And there was a guard standing there. And what did he do? He put something in her cell. What was it? Banana. But it wasn't one banana. It was 92 bananas. A whole bunch, literally a whole bunch of bananas were put in her cell. Okay. So how many bananas did she ask God for? One. How many did she get? 92. Does, can God answer our prayers beyond what we think he can do sometimes? Sure he can. Okay. In fact, she tells the story, you know, after she got out, after the war and everything, God still sends her bananas in different ways. People give her bananas. She, good thing she still likes bananas. But God cares about little things, right? His eyes on the sparrow. He loves little things. Let me tell you about a guy. Okay, we've talk, had enough girls for a while. Let's talk about a guy. Okay, there was this fellow back in the 1950s, and he was smart, he was athletic, he was a wrestler, he was on a wrestle, wrestling team in college. Okay. How many of you guys like to wrestle? You like, you like to wrestle with your brothers or your friends? Or like, just around? Yeah, that's good. All right, so this guy, he was a good wrestler. Okay, he was a great athlete, he was smart, he was good looking. Okay, everything that we think, you know, from a worldly perspective, everything we think is important, right? He had it all. And so he was in, studying the Bible in college. And so he felt God wanted him to be a missionary. And he had friends, you know, even Christian friends, who would say, well, you want to be a missionary? But you have so much you could offer right here. Because he wanted to be a missionary down in South America, in the jungles, to these Indian tribes that had never heard about God before. And people would say, but you got so much to offer. I mean, you're smart. I mean, you're the best Bible student we got. You could be a pastor of this big church here in America, and you could send missionaries, right? That's good, right? And help the people here in America, because people in America need to hear about God, right? So but he said, no, God's called me to be a missionary. And so he went to South America, to this little tribe. Well, actually, the thing is, he couldn't even get to the tribe he wanted to go to because that tribe was very fierce. Any outsiders that came into their territory, they would kill them. Right? Because there have been oil companies. There's a lot of oil in that area. Some oil companies were trying to build oil wells there. And every time the oil company was trying to send people in there to find out about oil, they'd all get killed. And so he couldn't even go into the tribe where he wanted to go. But he still felt God wanted him to, to reach that tribe. And so there were several other men that he was working with 
Let's try to get theirs. Okay, one was a pilot. And so they would fly over the area where this tribe was, and they would give them gifts. Okay, and they would try to help them to see that these were nice guys. Okay, we're nice guys. We're not out to try to hurt you. Because right, the oil company had killed a bunch of these people too. So I mean, they, were, they had some good reason to be kind of defensive. All right, and so finally, they got to the place where they thought it was going to be all right. They had someone who had escaped from that tribe. Who, and so they're able to learn some of the, a little bit of the language. And so they landed on a sandbar beside a river in the area where this tribe was. And so they would call out in the jungle, say, we're friends. We want to help you. And then a couple people from the tribe came out. And the, they were, you know, this, the missionaries were overjoyed. They said, yes, here we are. And so they helped them. They showed them some things. And they actually took one of them up in the plane and let them fly around. They flew over the village. And so they said, this is great. So you know, then those few left. And then the next day, a war party from the tribe came and killed all five of the missionaries. Why would God do that? I mean, these people are trying to serve God. They're trying to give the gospel to this Indian tribe. And God lets them get killed before they had a chance to really talk to anybody. Here was this guy. Okay, his name was Jim Elliott. He had all this potential. Okay, the pilot was Nate Saint. You may have heard of Nate Saint too. These guys had great potential. They had a heart to serve God. They just killed for nothing. Do you think God knows what he's doing? Okay. Because of the death of these missionaries, the word got out. And it was headline news all over the world about these missionaries that were killed. And in the United States, thousands and thousands of young people heard what had happened. And they felt God's call to be missionaries. said, well, they weren't able to, to go. I'll go. I'll spread the gospel. I'll go somewhere. I'll tell people about Christ. And God raised, has raised up and is still raising up because of this story. Thousands and thousands of missionaries to preach the gospel all over the world. So did Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, did they die for nothing? No. They didn't accomplish what they thought God had called them to do. But God had a bigger plan that they couldn't see. So God used their lives to inspire thousands and thousands of other lives to serve Christ. You know, and that's what we don't see sometimes because we're thinking about our little stuff, right? This is important to me, right? So that's the most important thing there is. Keep your hands off it, right? Stay away. This is mine. Okay, but God doesn't look that way. And we shouldn't look that way either. We say, this isn't mine. This is God's. I'm God's. Everything I have is God's. My life is God's. And whatever he wants to do with me, whatever he wants to do with my money, whatever he wants to do with my stuff, that's okay. Because God knows what he's doing. Okay? We see our little stuff, and he sees the big picture. Big picture. Well, let's talk about another guy. Somebody you may have heard of, because you're homeschoolers, you know all these things. Okay, there was an, another young man. He was very fast. He could run fast, very fast. He was a great athlete, so he ran track. He played rugby. He and his brother were the best rugby players at their college. Okay, they were on the national team. They were in England. They were on the national team. All right, so that's a bit like being in the NFL. All right, so these guys are good. Hey, and they were fast. All right. And this one fellow, his name was Eric, Eric Little. Who's heard of Eric Little? All right, so there's a movie about him, about this big race. He was in the Olympics. Okay. And he won 
these races. And his best, in the Olympics, his best race was 100 meters, a really short, fat, really fast sprint. Okay, but because the race was going to be on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, he said, I'm not going to race on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is for the Lord. It's not for my glory, it's for the Lord. And so, instead of running in his best race, he ran at 400 meters, which is a lot different. It doesn't seem like it would be that much different, but it's a lot different to run 400 meters than it is 100 meters. So he ran that race at 400 meters in the Olympics, and he won. He won the gold medal. He was a national hero. They came back to England, and they carried him all through the town on, on people's shoulders, and there was a big parade. And he could have made a lot of money playing rugby, going around speaking to people and doing all kinds of things. I mean, he was the most famous person in England. But he said, no, God has called me to be a missionary. And so he went to China to be a missionary. And he served, China, he served in China for years. And then again, World War II came and the Japanese captured that part of China where he was and put him in prison, in a prison camp with hundreds of other people. So what did he do there? He said, I can't believe God's doing this to me. I'm just trying to serve him and I'll get thrown in a prison camp. Is that what he did? No. Because another thing was, besides being a, just a, reg a regular missionary, he was also a teacher. He taught science. And there were a lot of young people that were also in the prison. So he taught science in the prison. And he taught the Bible in the prison camp. They would have classes. And in fact, he even taught chemistry. Now, they didn't have any equipment. They didn't have a lab with all kinds of beakers and all that. But he wrote out the notes. And he said, all right, if we were to do this experiment, if we were to combine this chemical and this chemical and put them together, okay, it would explode and we'd all die. No. But he said, but he wrote out the experiments and said, this is what would happen. And so he taught chemistry without any textbook, without any supplies at all. He said, this is what God has called me to do. And he had a servant's heart. Okay, if someone needed water, because conditions got worse and worse at the prison. Okay, if someone needed water, he would go. In fact, when they got to the prison camp, they were the first ones there. Okay, it was a huge mess because it hadn't been used in years. And the toilets were all overflowing and nasty. And the, the areas where they're supposed to live were all covered with bugs and dust and creatures. And, okay, so he said, oh, I have a college degree. I'm a national hero. I'm not going to do that. No, he said, this is what needs to be done. I'm going to do it. So he's in there cleaning toilets with everybody else. He's in there sweeping and hauling wood and whatever else needed to be done. He would do it. He had a servant's heart. Okay, he didn't let his talents and his, his fame get to him. He didn't think it was important. Because I'm just a servant of the Lord. Okay. But, a, but we would consider a sad thing is not long before that prison camp was, was rescued by the Americans, he got sick. And he died in the prison. And we would say, again, why would God let that happen? I don't know. But I do know that God doesn't make mistakes. Okay, and again, thousands and thousands of people have been inspired by Eric Little. Okay, not, just his, not just his running, not just his racing, okay, but by his servant heart. See, I'm a Christian. I'm going to use my talents for God. Okay, how many people in here are athletes like to play sports? Like to play sports? Who play sports? I All right. like sports. You like sports too? Okay. All right. Can God use your athletic talent to bring glory to Him? Yes. Sure. Of course, you have to remember, this is one thing that Eric Little would say. He would say, God made me fast. Now, he worked hard to develop that talent, but he gave the glory to God. So sometimes what happens to us, because we get kind of proud, yep. Fastest guy in my grade, fastest guy in my group, fastest guy in my homeschool group. Yeah, well, who made you that way? God, right? And can God, I don't want to be negative, but could God take that away? 
Yeah. I mean, could you get in an accident or something like that and not be able to walk? Yeah? All right, so, and I'm not saying that should happen or necessarily would happen, but it, it should make us think, this is from God. I need to give that back to him. I want to glorify God. Let's see. What's another story I can tell? How about a little tidbit from uh, someone else you're going to hear about later on. There was a woman, we'll go back to women, there was a woman that lived in Holland, and she came from a Christian family, the Christian, the whole family loved God. And father had a watch making shop, he was a watchmaker. You know who it is, don't you? Who is it? Corey Ten Boom. Boom. Okay. And God used them, and they loved Lord Jesus, and they tried to serve him, and they honored him in their business. And you know, some of these stories, a lot of these stories have to do with World War II, just happened to be that way. Okay. But when the, the Nazis, the Germans, took over Holland, okay, they tried to get rid of the Jews, all the Jewish people, because the Nazis didn't like Jewish people. And so Corey and her family, they tried to help the Jews to get out of Holland so they could be safe. Now, why would they do that? Because they knew that if they got caught, they go to prison. We've got a lot of prison stories here, don't we, today? You know, but, but that's a little side note here. Okay, even in this country, even though we've had a lot of freedom for 200 and some years, more than that, okay, it might be in your lifetime when, if you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, you try to serve God, you might end up in prison. That could happen in this country in your lifetime. So you need to think about that, too. Tuck that away in your mind. Right. Hey, but Corey and her family, they, they serve God. Oops, excuse me. Okay, they help these Jews people get away, get away. They hit them in their house. Okay. And one time, the, the Nazis did come to their house. And Corey and her family were taken away to prison. Okay, but... And there were some Jewish people at their house at the time, and they had a hiding place. How many of you have seen the movie The Hiding Place? Have you seen the movie? Okay, so you know the story. Okay, they made a special room behind the closet, and so the, the Jewish people they could kind of squeeze in there side by side. Okay, and so then they closed it off so no one would know they're there. And so when the Nazis came, they didn't find the Jewish people that were hiding there. And Corey and her family they all went to, to prison. And Corey, at this prison where she was, she was very lonely. She was in a cell all by herself. And in fact, it got to the point where one day she saw an ant crawling on the floor of her cell. And she thanked God for the ant because it was some living creature that she could see but just besides, instead of just looking at the walls. But one day she got a letter. And she noticed that on the, on the envelope, the writing kind of was real slanted. And she thought, well, that's strange, because that person doesn't normally write going up like that. That's strange. And then she thought about it for a second. And she peeled away the stamp, because the writing was pointing towards the stamp. So she peeled away the stamp. And it's a little message written underneath where the stamp was. It says, all watches safe. Okay? So that meant the Jewish people were all safe. They didn't get captured. So even though she was captured, People that she was trying to help weren't. They got away. They got away. You know, the Lord Jesus said, Greater life has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, that's what the Lord Jesus did, right? I mean, he died for us. He laid down his life for us. And so we should be willing to lay down our lives for other people. You know, sometimes it's harder to live for Jesus than it is to die for Jesus. You know, the scripture talks about, you know, Paul says, I die daily. Or the scripture says, give yourself a living sacrifice. So how many, now, I'll tell you what, you don't have to raise your hand for this. You just think about it. Because right? I don't want to embarrass anybody. Okay? Has there ever been a time when one of your folks asked you to do something? And you really didn't want to do it? 
But rather than saying, no, I'm not doing that, no, he said, OK, I'll do it. All right, how many, I'll, I'll do it that way. Okay, how many have ever been in that situation where you did something you really don't, didn't want to do, but you did it anyway because you knew it was the right thing to do? Okay, see? That's part of the Christian life. That's a big part of the Christian life. Okay? That's dying to self. Say, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to serve Jesus. That's dying. I'm going to die to what I want so I can do what's right. So that's what a lot of these people have done that we're talking about in this story. Let me tell you a story about how God used an animal. Think God can use an animal? He can do anything. All right, there's a story in the Bible about God. Well, there's several stories in the Bible about how God used an animal. Okay, one of the famous ones is when there's, there was a prophet, Balaam, was going to go do something wrong. God used an animal, didn't he? What animal did he use? Donkey. A donkey. What did he make the donkey do? Talk. Talk. All right, how many of you have ever had a conversation with a donkey? No? All right, so God used a, an animal to do something special. All right, there's another time, this, this is a true story, back in the 1800s, there was a ship captain, okay, on a big sailing ship, and he was a Christian. And they were sailing, and the ship that he was sailing hit some rocks that were under the water. They didn't, they didn't see him in time to steer away. And it caused, put a big hole in their ship, like this. And the ship was taking on water. It was starting to sink. It was going to sink if something didn't happen. They were trying to pump it out, but it was coming in faster than they could get it out. So what do you think he did? He's a Christian. What would he do? What should we do every time we come to the church? Pray. All right, so that's what he did. He said, Lord, I don't know what to do. The ship is going to sink. I don't want to sink. Okay, these men might drown. What, I, you know, this is a bad situation. God, Lord, you got to help. So all of a sudden, the water stopped coming in the ship. And they couldn't get to the area where the hole was because it's all filled with that area. The ship is still filled with water. So they couldn't figure out what to stop the, hole, what to stop the leak. Something stopped the leak. So they got, finally, they sailed to uh, the port and they put the ship in what's called dry dock where they take the ship out of the water so they can look at it. And they went up to the bow of the ship where the hole was and there was a porpoise like a dolphin, stuck in the hole. The porpoise was just the right size to stop the hole. It's like putting a cork in the hole. Unfortunately, the porpoise died. But God used an animal like that. Isn't that kind of strange? That's a weird kind of story, isn't it? But can God do anything? Yes. yes. Huh? Can he send a porpoise to stop up your hole? Sure he can. Can he send an ant to keep you company in your little cell? Sure he can. Yes, sir. Real quick. Um, and there's also the story of Jonah where God used an animal. That's right, the story of Jonah. God used a big fish, right? How many of you would like to be swallowed by a big fish and stay there for a couple of days? That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Okay. But, you know, but sometimes God has to get our attention that way, right? Mm. All right. So God can do all kinds of things to take care of us. Let me tell you another story. Okay, this is about a man and his mother. And this may be a man that you've heard about too. But I want to give honor to his mother too because he wouldn't be where he was if it weren't for his mother. Okay, how many of you have a great mother? Everyone should raise your hand. Uh, there shouldn't be anyone that's not raising their hand. All mothers are great, wonderful. Okay. Mothers aren't perfect, 
Okay, but remember we talked about dying daily, giving your life. That's what mothers do every day. All right, so this, this man, he grew up in a real bad part of town because his mother had been married and found out that his father was doing bad things, and so they had to leave. So this mother had two boys, and so she was taking care of them. And she was working two or three jobs just to try to pay the bills so their family could, would be all right. That's a lot of work. I mean, just being a mother is a lot of work. Okay, but she, like I said, she's working two or three jobs, so she was gone all the time. And because of the bad situation she'd been in, she would get depressed sometimes because it just things, seemed like things weren't working out. See, this mother, she didn't know how to read because she had had to drop out of school to work, and then she got married when she was real young. So she didn't even know how to read. So she had to do jobs like laundry, cleaning houses, because that's all she could do. And she was afraid her boys were going to turn out like her, because they weren't very good students. They just kind of messed around all the time. And so one time she was cleaning a man's house. And this man was a college professor. And so she went in this one room, and there were books everywhere. How many of you have a house where you got books everywhere? Homeschoolers must have books everywhere. Yeah, okay. So this man had books everywhere. And so she was kind of looking at him. Have you read all these books? He said, well, most of them. She was amazed. And then she noticed he had a TV, but in front of the TV were stacks of books. So he didn't ever look at TV. And so that just made her think. And so she went home. And her boys were sitting there, and they were watching TV. So she came up. Turn off the TV. All right, we're not going to have TV. Okay, you're going to watch one program a week. He said, what? We can't live two programs a week. Thank you. We can't live without TV. That, that's, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Right? How are we going to survive without TV? He said, you're going to read. Okay, you're going to read books, and you're going to write reports and give them to me about what you read. Now, she couldn't read the reports, but she'd look at them. She'd kind of mark them up a little bit. And, and so those boys learn to love learning. Okay, and one of them became Dr. Ben Carson. How many of you have heard of Ben Carson? Okay. So this is a boy who couldn't even, couldn't hardly read, couldn't do his, his math tables, his multiplication tables. Okay, he became a brain surgeon, operating on people's brains. You have to be pretty smart to be a brain surgeon, don't you? Right? How many of you want to be operated on by a dumb brain surgeon? No, okay. So. <laughs> All right. So his mother, okay, his brother became an engineer, right? Which you have to be smart too to design buildings and things. All right. So his mother, eventually she learned how to read too, but she sacrificed herself. Okay? Does God care about People that live in the projects and don't have any money, don't seem like they have any future. Does God care about them? Yes. yes. All right. Are there things that we can do to help folks that maybe in, aren't in our situation? Yeah. I mean, because I'm going to put it to you straight. Okay, if you're being homeschooled, okay, even if your parents aren't perfect, which they probably aren't, okay, even if you lose stuff and get a little disorganized sometimes and don't have time for this or that, you have a great advantage over the vast majority of young people in this country. Okay, you have a special gift. And because of that, you can give that gift to other folks. Okay? You guys, because of your freedom of, of schedule, okay, you don't have to be in a building from 8 in the morning till 3 o'clock every day, right? You have to be in this building and sit in this little seat, from, right? You have a lot of flexibility. Okay, I'm sure you probably have schedules. But you've got a lot of flexibility. Okay, you can go and do things that other people can't do. Okay. And God is preparing you to do something great. Okay, God has a plan for your life. God, just like God had a plan for, for Fanny Crosby's life, God had a plan for Amy Carmichael's life. 
God had a plan for Corey Ten Boom's life, for Eric Little's life, right? Yeah, but that's them. They're big, important people. I, I'm just me, right? No. Does God have a plan for your life? 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 What about you? Okay, what about you? Okay. How many of you are trying to seek the Lord, okay, even now, say, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Okay, now God will use, good, the gifts and abilities that you have to be able to do that. Sometimes God will use your weaknesses. Because where I am, the scripture says, where I am weak, he is strong. Yeah, just like Fanny's blindness. That's an area of weakness, right? But he used that. So you need to be praying about what God wants you to do. All right, let me tell you about another man. We're going back and forth with men and women. That's good, right? We'll break it up a little bit. This is another guy who's real smart. Real smart. He was very good with languages. Okay? By the time he was finished with college, he knew a bunch of different languages. And that's a special gift, right? How many of you, like, how many of you speak another language, a second language besides English? Anybody speak French, German, Spanish, Italian, Lithuanian? Okay. All right, so that's good. That's a special gift. I mean, everyone in America, we think everyone should speak English. But if we can learn other languages, that, that opens up more opportunities to serve, right? So this man was real smart. And this was back a long time ago in England. And back then, the Bible was in Latin. How many of you know Latin? Anybody studying Latin? A few people studying Latin? All right. Okay. And that's what language the Bible was in. So even back then, most people didn't know Latin. So this man said, this William Tyndale, he said, if we want more people to come to Christ, we need to have God's word in a language they can understand. Most people don't know Latin. It's not doing, it's not doing any good for the Bible to be in Latin. So he said, I'm going to translate the Bible into English so people can read it for themselves. The problem was, at that time, it was against the law to translate the Bible into English. Because they thought it, Latin was such a, a sophisticated, elegant language that the Bible should be in that language instead of just the common tongue where ordinary people can read it. And so... He said, this is one time where, you know, we're supposed to obey our human authorities, right? Right? Okay. But if God's word and the human authorities are different, we got to need to go with God, don't we? So, he said, I'm going to translate the word of God. And he couldn't do it in England because it was against the law. They were trying to capture him. So he went over to Europe, to mainland Europe. Okay, and he translated the Bible. And he got the whole thing done. But the authorities got all the, cop got all the copies they could. They actually were buying them so they could burn them. So they bought all the copies that they had and burned them. And then, honestly, he was you know, still trying to revise it, make sure it was just right. And then he was shipwrecked. And all his work was lost. He didn't have it on his computer. He didn't have it on a little, you know, thumb drive. He could save it around. It was all gone. And he had to start over again. But you know what? He used the money from where the authorities had bought the Bible to pay for a new printing. And his second translation was even better than the first one. So his enemies actually made, it, made him have a better translation than he had originally. So it was even better. Now, eventually, he was caught, and he was killed. But even then, even as he was being burned at the stake, his last prayer was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And within a few years, the King of England allowed 
an English translation of the Bible. Okay. How many of you read a Bible in English? Okay. You can thank William Tyndale for the Bible that you have. Okay. So here's one man. Now he had people that helped him, worked with him. But one man has affected millions and millions of people. Okay. If it weren't for his translation, we wouldn't be here. You know, and all through life, we have a path that we need to take. You know, so sometimes we might picture, you know, sometimes picture like heavens, like the mountaintop experience, you know, if we get to heaven. If we want. But sometimes, you know, the path doesn't go straight up where we think it should go. Right? Sometimes we get taken to prison, we get somewhere else, and the path goes off a different way. And we say, Lord, what are you doing? I'm supposed to be going this way, not this way. But the Lord knows that we need to go over here to get there. So we have to trust him. He just messed, he had this beautiful picture, he just messed it up. It doesn't seem like God does that sometimes. And as you get a little older, you'll see that God does seem to do that sometimes. We'll have a perfectly great life, and then, shoom, it gets messed up. What's going on with that? You know, God can take these, what would seem to be mess ups, and turn it into something wonderful. Okay, just like when he takes our path off the, where we think we should be going, he'll use it for his good. He'll use it for his glory. And we have to think about that. So when things come into our life and say, God, I didn't want this to happen. We have to trust God, that God knows what he's doing. That God has a different plan than maybe our picture had. His picture might be a little bit different. But his picture is the best one. There's a little bird right here. Can you see a little bird? Okay. We're little birds. We're little sparrows. Okay. And his eye is on the sparrow. Okay. You know that song? Okay. You know, how many know the chorus? Can you sing the chorus with me? I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Right? And each of us can sing that. Because we're little sparrows in God's hands. Sometimes we may think we're big and tough. But we're not big and tough. We're just little sparrows in God's hands. But he's watching us. He's watching us. He has his eye on us all the time. Okay? Sometimes it seems like he can't see us, right? Can't see. But he can see us. All the time. Which should be a good comfort to us if we're doing right, right? It should be a warning to us if we're trying to do what's wrong. Because God sees us when we're doing wrong too. But God can take our picture. That's good. And make it into something beautiful. You know, and at the end of the story, when we get to heaven... You know, we get to where you know, we've, we've tried to seek the Lord and we've tried to do what is right and try to have a good attitude when things seem like they're going wrong. And we say, God, I trust you. You know, the Bible says there's going to be a reward for those who trust him. Okay, there's going to be a crown of life for those who love the Lord Jesus. And our goal in life should be to seek after that crown. Now, we're not going to see it in this lifetime. Okay, just like Jim Elliott, okay, he died before he could see his reward. He didn't see those Alka Indians come to Christ. But there's a reward for him. There's a reward for us. So we have to remember that. Okay? How many want the Lord, when we get to heaven, he wants, you want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay? Don't you like it when your parents say, hey, you did a good job with that? Isn't that a nice feeling? How much more when the Lord says, you did a good job with that? 
You are faithful. Okay? And that's what we all should be looking for. All right, so remember, his eyes on the sparrow. And you know that he's watching me as well. All right, so let's close with a word of prayer. Okay. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you care for us. Okay, even though we're poor and weak and sinful, that you love us, you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die for us. And I praise you, Lord, that you care for us so much, you care even for the little things in our life. I praise you would help us to give everything to you. In Jesus' name, amen.